I think it's okay to start my analysis of Guillermo del Toro's Pan's Labyrinth with a spoiler. Ophelia, the main character, she dies at the end. I feel fine doing that because del Toro does the exact same thing with his movie. The first shot of Pan's Labyrinth is the ending, and it's also the first way in which del Toro complicates that ending. But before we get into that, a few things about fairy tales. For most of us, the authoritative source for fairy tales is Walt Disney. And that's no accident. Disney set out to claim that authority when he made films like Snow White, Cinderella, or Sleeping Beauty by adapting folk tales in the public domain and copywriting the adaptations. Still, because film was a relatively new medium, capturing the authority he wanted required Disney to remain faithful to the original versions of these stories, popularized by Charles Perrault and the Brothers Grimm. He made the transition from print to cinema as smooth as possible for the audience, even going so far as to begin his movies with the opening of a book. Disney was smart. His films are now regarded as classics. And yet, by remaining so faithful to the story's 19th century antecedents, he inherited and furthered their 19th century morality, a conservative patriarchal value system in which the prince always comes to save the helpless heroine, a value system that was antiquated even then. In this way, Disney limited the kinds of things a fairy tale can do. In Pan's Labyrinth, Guillermo del Toro attempts to explode these limitations, and he does so by recontextualizing these stories. Instead of pulling from a single authoritative source, del Toro pulls from a huge number of sources, giving none precedence over the others, and letting them all play against one another to create meaning. The film tells the story of the little girl Ophelia and her mother Carmen as they go to live with the hyper-fascist Captain Vidal five years after the Spanish Civil War. Vidal is trying to snuff out the last remnants of rebellion in the mountains, awaiting his child's birth by Carmen, while Ophelia becomes ensnared in a magical quest after a fawn tells her that she is the lost princess of an underground realm. From here, the story spins out into two parallel narratives, the magical quest and the political drama. Crucially, neither of these narratives becomes reducible to the other. Del Toro makes a point of this by entwining them in ways that makes any totalizing explanation problematic. At the end of the film, for example, we get what seems to be the nail in the coffin for the magical quest. Vidal approaches Ophelia speaking with the fawn, and when the camera cuts to his point of view, the fawn is not there. This appears to be solid evidence for those who read Ophelia's quest as a coping mechanism for her sad life. But if we back up, we can see how del Toro complicates that reading by remembering that Vidal has just been drugged with a heavy dose of sleeping medication. In other stories, drug-induced hallucinations are used to explain away why people see the supernatural. But in Pan's Labyrinth, it's the opposite. Del Toro uses the device to destabilize our trust in Captain Vidal's point of view. Here and elsewhere, the film refuses to obey our desire for an all-encompassing explanation. Of course, disobedience is a major theme in this film. ¿Por qué no me obedeció? Es que obedecer por obedecer, así sin pensarlo. Eso solo lo hacen gentes como usted. Whereas in many fairy tales, disobedience is the act that sets the story in motion, here, disobedience is framed as a vital and important quality. There's the disobedience of the rebels who seek to free Spain from the grip of fascism, the disobedience of Mercedes who works with the rebels, and of course, the disobedience of Ophelia, who by turns questions and disregards the commands of her mother, the captain, and the fawn. But the most effective and, I think, impressive disobedience here is that displayed within the very text of the movie. And this is where del Toro's intense referencing comes into play. The name of the game here is multiplicity, undermining a single authoritarian master narrative like those championed by Vidal and fascism in general, by setting up a network of intertexts that make meaning 
a matter of choice. Now think of all the linking references in the Pale Man scene, for example. You have the ogre himself nodding to other child-eating ogres in other mythologies like Krampus. It also refers to the Greek Titan Kronos, who devoured his godchildren in order to, like fascist Spain, keep the young from replacing them and coming into their own. Also, it should be noted that Kronos is the title of Del Toro's first film, one of many things that links his body of work together. The table itself links back to the banquet scene earlier in the film, putting the pale man in the same position as Vidal, who will go on to kill a child. The pile of shoes link forward and will go on to recontextualize Ophelia's red shoes, itself a link to The Wizard of Oz and the 1948 film by Powell and Pressburger. Recontextual as images reminiscent of the piles of clothes from Nazi concentration camps. And the scene itself functions as a metaphor for how beauty, like say the beauty of old fairy tales, can enchant us into certain lines and ways of thinking that may not be in our interest. Here you have constructed a vast network of citation that reaches elsewhere in the film and outside of it. The lines of that network are for the viewers to follow as they see fit. Del Toro laces these references together with camera work and editing to achieve a narrative momentum that's undeniable when you watch his movies. It was the purpose of Vidal, like it is the purpose of all authoritarian regimes or patriarchal moralistic fairy tales, to limit the number and kinds of stories that can be told from a set of facts or events. Indeed, limit it to one story. The only thing for it is to disobey. In old fairy tales, the stories were closed out and contained by two words, the end. Del Toro's genius is to use perhaps this most formulaic genre of all and disobey our expectations of how it should unfold and how it should end. The rebels capture and kill Vidal, but Spain will continue under authoritarian dictatorship for 30 years. Ophelia is murdered, but completes her quest and returns to the underground realm. You can read that as a poetic ending to a sad story, a happy ending to a fairy tale, or Ophelia's final choice of the story she wants to tell for and about herself. Of course, she doesn't have to choose at all. No single story could contain her. For even when she returned to the world of magic, it is said. She left small traces of her time on earth, visible to those who know where and how to look. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. Uh, Pan's Labyrinth has been one of my favorite movies since I saw it in theaters, so this was just a blast to make. Um, if this is the type of content that you don't think you're seeing anywhere else on, on YouTube or the internet, you can support this channel by pledging to my Patreon page right here. Everything helps. You guys have been amazing with that, uh, and it really is what makes this channel possible and keeps it going. Um, so I'm going to Paris for the next couple weeks. Uh, I might miss a week. I'm talking to you from the past right now, but uh, uh, if I don't see you next Wednesday, I'll see you the Wednesday after that.